So this is this is actually an interesting um, study, basically looking at natural fertility. So this is no not fertility treatment in any way. It's natural fertility in several different populations of patients that do not use any contraception. And you can see that the rate falls dramatically in the late 30s and into the 40s. It really plummets. And so this is where we get this idea of advanced age being related to when fertility is really declining significantly. So what is ovarian reserve? So really quite simply put, it is the number of oocytes left in the ovary, the quantity, not the quality. So the quality, which is the potential of a fertilized egg to result in life-born infants, is the result we all care about in the end. But the quantity is a part of how likely that is to happen, but in theory, you really just need one. So at the time of puberty, you know, estimated ovarian reserve is about 500,000. And then during a woman's reproductive period, about 400 oocytes are ovulated. By menopause, overall ovarian reserve declines to you know, less than 1,000 oocytes. So, you know, age obviously is a big factor in ovarian reserve. There are other factors, you know, shown here, you know, they are genetics, medical interventions, environmental factors, autoimmune disease, chemotherapy, they can all play a role. And tests of ovarian reserve can be, you know, either biochemical assays or it can be ultrasound. And biochemical tests can be further divided into cycle-dependent, cycle-independent, or proactive testing. So really the goal of ovarian reserve testing is to add prognostic information to the counseling and planning process to help couples choose among treatment options because ovarian reserve tests test quantity, not quality of the remaining OSI pool. Um, these ovarian reserve tests are not infallible. They're not meant to be the sole criteria used to deny access to ART. Um, However, I have to say this is used heavily in insurance, but as we see from here, decreased ovarian reserve does not necessarily equate with inability to conceive. So who should we screen? Um, this is taken from the ACOG committee opinion uh, about genetic carrier screening. It states that genetic carrier screening should be offered to all pregnant women. Um, this allows women to consider prenatal diagnosis as well as pregnancy management options. Um, however, they also note that carrier screening um, should ideally be done prior to pregnancy. That does allow couples to pursue a broader range of reproductive options. The options available to the couple are several. Um, they don't obviously have, have to do anything with the information that is learned. Um, they can uh, go with it and just understand that they may ha have a higher risk of having a child um, with a problem or be reassured that their risk is reduced. Um, they can get pregnant and screen the pregnancy depending upon the disease um, via amniocentesis um, and then make the decision if they choose to terminate that pregnancy. Obviously, in some cases, this might in inform a decision to not try to achieve pregnancy or to adopt. Using sperm or egg donation um, is an option if certain uh, diseases are desired to be avoided. Um, and then the final option is to do IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing. So this is a video of how a biopsy is performed. So what you see on the left is the holding pipette, and then we have your embryo. Um, so you can see the outer trophectoderm as well as that inner ball is the inner cell mass. The bright light in the middle of the screen is the laser, um, and that laser is gonna be used to make a, a small hole in the zona pellucida. This technique is actually slightly different than what we do in the lab now, but it gives you an idea of how these biopsies are performed. It's a small hole in the shell. And next, the biopsy pipette is going to come in. And some of those trophectoderm cells are going to be aspirated. We are typically removing between five and 10 cells from the trophectoderm. So that's what's going into the holding pipette now. 
And then that laser is going to be used to snip off the biopsy. Um, so you'll see that laser go back and forth now um, to snip off that, that biopsy specimen. And then the embryo recoils a little bit as after the biopsy is performed. What you're seeing here is an embryo dividing in the lab under the microscope. So it's gone from the one cell stage to the four cell stage um, and is now continuing to divide. This is a time lapse video over a course of approximately five days uh, for an embryo to develop. Um, and at this point, it's developing into a blastocyst, um, which has two different cell lines. Um, so what you saw in that video um, is the embryo developing from the one cell stage to a cleavage embryo um, on day three. Uh, embryos typically have approximately uh, six to eight cells. And then by day five to seven, they've reached what's called the blastocyst stage, which is greater than 100 um, different cells. So this is um, the structure of a blastocyst. A blastocyst is a three-dimensional object. You're looking at a cross-section here. Um, the outside in purple is the zona pellucida, so that's the shell around the embryo. Um, the orange cells are trophoblast cells. Um, those make up the trophectoderm. Trophectoderm will ultimately develop into the placenta as well as the extra embryonic um, tissues like the, the amniotic um, sac. And then the, the blue cells um, are embryoblast cells referred to as the inner cell mass. Um, those are the embryo or the cells rather that are going to develop into the embryo and then ultimately into the fetus and then the baby. So let's start with reviewing the treatment options for uh, lesbian or same sex female relationships. Um, one of the forefront treatment options um, for uh, couples presenting for care is insemination with donor sperm. Now, of course, these IUI cycles can be monitored or unmonitored, so involving ultrasound and blood work um, or not, um, and they can be medicated or unmedicated. One other treatment that you've probably started to see with a little bit more frequency for your patients is partner-assisted reproduction um, or reciprocal IVF, as it's often called in publication. It's basically a process where one partner undergoes ovarian stimulation for egg retrieval, and then the second partner undergoes preparation of the uterine lining to actually receive the embryo for transfer. Of course, it's important to know that donor egg treatment and surrogacy or third-party reproduction are also available for lesbian couples. I'm sure they need it. So switching gears a little bit, so now same-sex male couples or gay couples, we know uh, in, in almost all cases, these guys, have, they are missing eggs and they're missing um, a uterus. <laughs> so we do need to engage um, an egg donor and a gestational carrier um, in order to help them build their families. And when we're looking at the egg donation piece, um, it can be somebody who essentially will, will, will do a cycle on the couple's behalf, or it can be um, eggs that are already uh, created that are coming from an egg bank, um, where an egg donor, typically a young woman in her 20s or early 30s, has already gone through a treatment cycle, and then her eggs have been sort of parsed out into smaller egg lots. Um, and that would be the, the typical way that the frozen donor egg banks work. So for patients who are assigned male at birth and are transitioning to a female role, um, sperm can be obtained through multiple ways. Um, for those who have been on gender-affirming hormones, um, so we're talking about estrogen and, and androgen blockers, um, typically they do need several months off those to collect a sperm sample. So it's wise to bank sperm before um, undergoing hormonal transition, if possible. If they have a female partner, um, a partner with a u or a partner with a uterus, um, they can uh, consider intercourse um, or insemination with fresh or frozen thawed sperm. IVF, if the sperm quality is compromised, um, uh, depending on the sperm parameters. If they have a partner with testes, um, then of course surrogacy with egg donation is an option or there's alternative forms of family building, um, fostering adoption, et cetera. There's several options for transgender individuals. Um, you know, in, in unless they've had a gender confirming surgery, there's typically oocytes available. 
either through stimulation of the ovaries from uh, fertility preservation, or um, in some cases, you know, if they've had a gender affirming treatment, um, surgery, and they've had their ovaries removed from potentially from a cisgender female partner. Uh, they can consider oocyte cryopreservation, so egg freezing. Also, it is possible to actually preserve the ovarian tissue itself, um, potentially when they're having their uh, bilateral salpingoophorectomy or hysterectomy or both. They can certainly choose to carry pregnancy themselves. Um, there's some very affirming studies that suggest that most trans men coming off testosterone will have a period within three months and have very good um, return to pregnancy rate. Um, and of course, a partner or surrogate may also carry the pregnancy. I think it's important to note that, of course, we also treat non-binary individuals. They may or may not be infertile, and their success rates would be expected to be similar to those who are cisgender, particularly if they've not gone through any, um, any uh, gender-affirming treatment.